Okay, today I am in Barry Island with Andrew Lowry. Thanks so much for agreeing to talk to us today, Andrew. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, for those that don't know, what is it you do? Well, I run an advisory service, Optimum Racing, um, and I've run an advisory service, a racing advisory service now for over 20 years. Um, Specialising in steeplechases, which uh, do all year round. And then in the summer, when it's a little bit quieter with the jumpers, I also get involved with the flat race in the major meetings, Royal Ascots, Glorious Goodwoods, etc. Okay, now I'm reliably informed that um, you're a rare beast that does actually provide a, a profitable service and has done for a long time. Uh, first of all, before we go into all the, the nitty gritty of that, can you give us a little bit about your background in your racing? Yeah, well, I think it's in the blood. You know, my granddad and, and my father both um, loved a recreational bet. Um, uh, and I got interested in it from a very early age. You know, I can remember going to Chepstow um, and seeing all those great champion hurdlers competing in the Welsh champion hurdle, you know, Night, Night Nurse, Monksfield, Sea Pigeon, horses like that. And that really captivated me. And, you know, going on from there, watching the racing on a Saturday with my father, uh, having the odd, uh, the odd bet then. Um, and it was something that just always really appealed to me. You were, t you were telling me earlier about your, uh, you mentioned your granddad there, you were, you were telling me earlier about the um, an incident at the Derby. Yeah, that's right. I think it was the first Derby after the war and a horse called Airborne won it. It was obviously a popular choice on the day. And he was on the downs um, watching the race and the bookmaker who took, took his bets did a runner. But a groover managed to actually um, find him, haul him down and... Uh, got his hod off him and they all sat round and tried to equally divide it. I don't think they got anywhere near what they were all entitled to, but they divided it the best they could between them and, uh, and made the best of a bad job. Luckily that doesn't happen at race courses anymore, but uh, <laughs> exactly. excellent story. Okay, so you left school in 1985. I did, yeah. And you were, so there's a bit of a black hole between you leaving school and actually getting involved professionally in, well, racing for the first time so what, what were you doing then? Yeah well I, I left school um, probably as an underachiever um, and I, I, as leaving school I really had no idea what I wanted to do um, you know being involved in racing seemed a million miles away at the time um, I'd always had an ambition to run my own company but again I didn't know where I was going to start uh, start with that so I, I went got myself a, a job in sales locally and spent the next uh, 10 years or so you know, in in that uh, in that environment. Okay, so were you betting in then? Oh yeah, very much so. You know, every you know, spare hour I had was still uh, was still very much you know, involved with horse racing. Only as a you know on a part time basis. But I can remember um, you know, some of the sales jobs I had. You know, allow you a bit of uh, a bit of flexible time if you like. And uh, uh, one particular job, I had an area that covered Herefordshire as well, and I used to spend uh, all morning on, on calls. Um, would work my way through Wales into Hereford and do a few um, a few uh, calls in, in the in the town, and then spend the afternoon uh, at the racecourse. And um, so it was it was evident from a long way before I started that that's why I was say destined to do, but certainly what I wanted to do. Um, and one particular day when I went to Hereford races, I took the phone in with me, the mobile phone, and uh, a client rang me and he's placing an order with me and uh, it's all going swimmingly. I said, yes, we'll get those down to you in the next 48 hours. And um, before we could finish the conversation, the Hereford tannoy went, went off and uh, welcomed him and everyone to the race course. So we continued the conversation and then uh, at the end of it, he said, oh, one more thing, Andrew. I said, well, sorry. He said, uh, make sure you win this afternoon, sir. <laughs> so were, were, were you successful betting at that point? Um, overall, no, no. I, f I found a, a niche in point-to-point -point racing. I used to go a lot of point-to-point -point racing every weekend when Sunday racing came in twice a weekend. Um, and I was finding that I was making it pay, but it's a limited season. And whilst I was making money through the winter months with that, um, I was probably giving the lion's share of it back throughout the summer. Um, and that's something I, I wanted to rectify. And I did that by joining a, uh, you know, an advisory service myself. Ah, no, so we're getting to the, this is where I've got to know you from, is Mark Holder, who we interviewed recently. Um, so you joined his tipping service in 96. Yes, it would have been, yeah. I was working in Cardiff at the time, and I remember going to a local bookmaker's lunchtime and seeing the adverts on the wall. 
Um, I was never much taken in by you know, all the jargon, this will win hard hell, this can't get beat, uh, this is the biggest certainty since David met Goliath and all that rubbish. I wanted something with a bit more substance to it. Um, I knew a little bit about Mark's history in racing with his family, his father was a, a successful trainer, um, and thought, yeah, I'll give, give that a go. Okay, because I, I, I used to like sending off for Ryan Hartley's One Horse Saturday letter for two quid and uh, R.S. Faulkner and all these, but they turned out to be, you know, th this rip-off. So what, what, do you think you were lucky that you, you've you got the mark first of all, or did you, you know, I, I, did you have sort of faith in him? Well, I, I was undoubtedly lucky that, you know, I went to the pen shop that one day where he had an advert in the paper. Um, so yeah, look, it could have been an, a number of uh, services I joined at the time, um, but I knew what type of service I wanted. Say rather than just the, you know, the the, the, the brash sort of uh, this will win type approach, I wanted something with a bit more, a bit more meat on the bones. Okay, so was was the I don't know, Mark used to give reasons why they mm. were back horses. Was that part of your education as a, a winner finder? that being a part of the tipping service rather than just blindly following everything? Yeah, well, I think that, that that's what I was looking for, and it, it gives you more confidence if you know why someone's backing it or recommending you to back it. Um, you know, why would you have your hard-earned cash on someone that just tells you the name of a horse? You, know, you want to know why you, you, you want to be playing at that price. Um, and, and I knew that's how Mark Service operated, you know, whether that was from the advert or, or one brief call. So that, that was, you know, that was the sort of um, service I wanted to join. And as well as making money from uh, his service, I learned an awful lot listening to him, you know, with, with giving the reasonings for, the, for having a bet. And that's something that, you know, I still take with me to today, you know, and, and something that, uh, you know, certainly stood me in, uh, stood me in good stead at the time. Okay, so w when you started, was it you started winning almost straight away? You didn't have to go for a few losers and have to take a leap well, of faith? Well, no, I was very lucky again, I think, with Mark, um, I know the first bet won, um, and I think three of his first four bets bets won. Um, and soon after I joined, he took on board Alan Potts, another very successful punter, who himself specialised on, as far as the jump racing was concerned, when he was with Mark, he, he specialised in those chases. And um, he joined, uh, it was probably two or three months after I'd subscribed to Mark, and his first five bets, he had one bet five consecutive days, uh, up to 10 to one, the first five all won. And I thought, blimey, you know, I've, I've made the right choice joining this service. And uh, so it wasn't so much a leap of faith. It didn't take me long to realize that uh, these guys knew what they were talking about. Um, was there any, any sort of staking advice? Because you, you can imagine a lot of people, especially inexperienced people, I know I would have done it, would have thought they found the golden goose and immediately overstretched and done their cobblers when they had a few losers. Yeah, advice, I think at that time Mark advised a monetary staking plan, I think, you know, he'd advise have 60 pound a win or whatever, and, and I stuck to that. Um, you know, I, I wasn't in it to try and make a quick buck. I was thinking, you know, I, I want this to, to last. So, yeah, I, I think I gradually up my stakes, but nothing dramatic and sort of you know, if, if they if Alan recommended a point system and I was playing to fifty pound a point, I would up that gradually to uh, to whatever level. Okay. So how difficult was it in those days to get your bets on if you were winning? It, it, I don't think it was difficult at all from memory. You know, it, um, you know I used to say I was still working full time at that stage, um, so most of the time it would be cash going into betting shops. Um, yeah, no, it, it's certainly no no issue compared to how it. How it is for most people uh, nowadays. Okay, were you still betting the points at that point as well? Yes, yeah, still enjoying the point to points. And um, like I say, I joined Mark at the end of the point, pr pretty much towards the end of the point season in May. Um, but then as soon as it started again, yeah, the point to point is 100 chases and yeah, very much doing my own thing as far as they were concerned. Right, so it's quite surprising that in, so he's joined Mark Holder as a, a customer of his tipping service in 96 and then in 97, if I got my facts right, you actually went pro punting. Yeah, it would have been 90, end of 97, 8, 98, around that sort so of time. Was yeah. it on the yeah. back of you literally going pro punting on their advices? or? Um, not solely. I was starting to do a little bit more of my own 
you know, learning from them as I was going along. But, um, but th yeah, that was the inspiration, and uh, I was quite happy to follow, you know, follow their advice. Um, back my own judgment with a hunter chase and point to pointers, um, and I was doing, you know, dabbling a little bit myself then and learning, uh, learning as I went on. Okay, you actually started working with Mark. When when did you first meet him personally? I um, first met him. I think it was the summer of about '98 it would have been uh, Bath Racecourse, and I just approached him at the paddy. He was, he was paddock watching. I introduced myself as a as a client and just told him how badly I wanted to get into racing and if there was anything he could help me with, you know, however trivial he may thought it trivial he may thought it was, then I would be more than more than willing to uh, to give it a go. Whether it was just sticking stamps on envelopes, I wanted at that stage desperately to get in into racing. Um, and into, into the betting side of it. I didn't really know still how to go about that. So what happened next? Um, so then, you know, I'd, I'd taken the, the leap of faith to sort of jack my job in and, and go punting. Um, and then on the back of some help from Mark and advice, I set up my own service. It was about 99, uh, a subscription service came a few years later but at that time I set up my own service on a on a premium rate line 50p a minute or whatever it was in those days and uh, you know it just grew from there really